We're also undertaking great projects. We're also trying to build houses for ourselves. We're also trying to put parks and gardens. We're, in a sense, when we read all of this, we're like, isn't this what we're aspiring to? Isn't this what society has trained us to look for and to fight for? We live in a society that's told us the man or woman who dies with the most toys wins. And so we go after accomplishing more than the next guy and accumulating more than the next person. Mm. We don't just want to keep up with the Joneses. Mm. That's so yesterday. Mm. I'm trying to beat the Joneses and rub their faces in it. Wow. And that resonates. Because mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do. Wow. And Solomon's like, I did that. I went after all of it. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. Good morning again, church. Good morning, good. Uh, it's good to be together. Uh, it's always an incredible honor to preach the Word of God. Turn with me to your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I thought we'd talk about the book of Ecclesiastes today. Yeah. And uh, I know someone was asking me earlier, is this a, a series that you're going to do? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Wow. Just a one-time thing. Wow. We're just going to talk about Ecclesiastes. In chapter 1, okay. verse 1, the Bible reads, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Mm. Now, anybody who studied out this book before knows that one of the running themes is the theme of meaninglessness. Mm. That Solomon, the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man who ever lived, the wisest king, the richest king, begins this book that he's writing for all people to read, and he's like, just so you understand where I'm coming from, your life is meaningless. Wow. I know nobody feels super encouraged to hear that. <laughs> yeah. That you're, in a sense, anybody who's trying to study out the Bible, you come across the book of Ecclesiastes for the first time, it's one of those books that actually kind of like, just digs right in here like, whoa! Slow down. It almost seems like this is kind of like a book that should not be in the Bible. That you're looking for hope, you're looking for encouragement, and you stumble upon this book, and in the first chapter, written basically by the wisest man who ever lived, you're hoping for some wise words, some secret information that's going to change. It's like, your life is meaningless. It's like, you might as well, you might as well not be alive. And then you begin to think about all the efforts that you're putting into your life. All the hard work you're putting in there. All the efforts you put into your relationships. And Solomon, who is wiser than you are, is like, you're wasting your time. <laughs> Everything is utterly meaningless. There is nothing to be gained from all that you're putting in there. And obviously, there's a lot more to the book. So maybe we could read a little bit more and I come to an understanding of why Solomon has come to the conclusion that everything is meaningless. Come on, bro, preach. In verse 12, he says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. Mm -hmm. He basically introduces himself just so you know who he is. He's like, I was the teacher. I was king in Jerusalem. And I made a decision to use the wisdom that God had given me to study and to explore and to figure out all that is done under heaven. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this book, Ecclesiastes, that we're going to read is Solomon's conclusions after using that incredible supernatural wisdom that he had from God to figure out what's the meaning for our existence. Mm. It's like, but before we read it further, let me tell you. It's <laughs> now, maybe if we study it through and we come to an understanding of why he came to these conclusions, maybe we too might come to either the same conclusion or maybe a different conclusion. Mm. 
A lot of people have wondered about this book, Ecclesiastes. Some have wondered whether Ecclesiastes was written in the later part of Solomon's life. Because everybody is familiar with Solomon's life. He started out as a wise, incredible king who, when God made him an offer, he said, just ask me for one thing that you want. Instead of asking for power, instead of asking for authority, instead of asking for fame, instead of asking for money, instead of asking for the death of his enemies, he's like, God, just give me wisdom mm -hmm. that I might be able to govern your people. Mm -hmm. And God is like, for asking such an incredible thing, I'm going to give you the thing you've asked for, mm -hmm. the wisdom to govern my people, but I'm also going to give you everything you didn't ask for. Mm -hmm. And so Solomon essentially becomes the richest man who ever lived, the wisest man who ever lived. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, his wisdom sadly did not save him. Mm -hmm. Because even in his wisdom, he marries many foreign women that God had told the Israelites not to do, and they basically steal his heart away from the Almighty God. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of his life, he had in a sense turned his back on God. Mm -hmm. And so most people who study out the book of Ecclesiastes assume maybe he wrote this not at the beginning when he was in love with God and God was blessing the work of his hands and everything was smooth sailing. Maybe he was writing this at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. When he was looking back on his life and all he had accomplished and he was discouraged, depressed about everything. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, maybe he said, everything is meaningless. Mm -hmm. But there's a little bit more to the story than that. Which is what we're going to try and study out today. Come on, Our first point, work for the Lord with all your might. Right. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Solomon says, in verse 4, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs for water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also want more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself, the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers, a harm as well, the delights of the heart of a man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands have done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Mm. The chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Mm. That's super discouraging. Yes. He says, I undertook great projects. He basically went after accomplishing and building so much good in this world. He says, I made gardens, I made parks, I bought male and female slaves, I even had slaves born in my house. I became greater by far than anyone who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I had more flocks than everybody. I gathered for myself the treasure of kings and provinces. And at the end of it all, nothing was gained. It was all meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Part of the reason why it's discouraging to read this is because for most of us, this is exactly what we are chasing today. We're also undertaking great projects. We're also trying to build houses for ourselves. We're also trying to put parks and gardens. Where, in a sense, when we read all of this, we're like, isn't this what we're aspiring to? Isn't this what society has trained us to look for and to fight for? We live in a society that's told us the man or woman who dies with the most toys wins. And so we go after accomplishing more than the next guy and accumulating more than the next person. Mm. We don't just want to keep up with the Joneses. Mm. That's so yesterday. Mm. I'm trying to beat the Joneses and rub their faces in it. Wow. And that resonates. Because mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do. Wow. And Solomon's like, I did that. Mm. I went after all of it. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. Mm. We've been taught in this world, in a sense, that nothing can stop you from getting what you want. Mm -hmm. That the only person that can stop you is you. Mm -hmm. And although, obviously, that's not necessarily like evil in of itself, what that brings in us is that we're not going to let anything stop us from going after what we want. Mm. And Solomon's like, I did that. <laughs> but at the end of all of it, it was meaningless. Mm. It was like I was chasing after the wind. 
one of the themes he writes in his book is that sadly, life and accomplishments and all these things that we're going after, it's like chasing the wind. Mm. Anybody who, as a young child, has chased the wind before knows that it's such a discouraging thing because at any moment you feel the wind in your grasp, mm. you can feel it in your hand. Mm. But when you go to close your hand to grab it, there's nothing there. Mm. It's almost like a cruel trick that life is playing on us. Mm. That the thing is so close, like the song says, so close you can almost taste it. Mm. But then when you go to close your eyes, there is nothing. Mm. He says, my heart took delight in all my work, and that was the reward for all my labor. Mm. His reward was everything that he accomplished. Nothing had been gained. Mm. How does Solomon feel about it? Look at chapter 2, verse 17. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had told for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet you have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all the toilsome labor under the sun. Mm. He had fought his whole life. He had toiled. He had gone after all of it. And getting to the end of his life, he says, I hated my life. Mm. And I hated everything I had accomplished. Why? Because even I cannot take any joy and encouragement in it. And all I could do is watch it be turned over to somebody else mm. who hadn't worked for it, who hasn't poured their life into it. And who knows, that person might be wise like I was, or they might be a fool mm. who have zero appreciation for how hard I have to work to get it. Mm. Mm. And he's like, and I have no control over it because mm. I must leave it. I must die. I must go. He says, all of it was meaningless. Mm. It was like chasing after the wind. And obviously, when you think about this, you can have two responses. You're like, we can basically give it to despair and be like, you know what? I'm done. My life is meaningless. So it's like I'm not doing it anymore. And all the students who are studying, for example, are like, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for letting me know this exam is meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. It doesn't matter if I do well or if I do bad. First off, don't call your parents and tell them. Make it said it's meaningless, I'm not steady. No. Oh, let's not do that. <laughs> but yes, the temptation could be for all of us to want to give up. Yeah. And to be like, it doesn't matter how hard I'm working right now, everything is going to be meaningless in the end. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we could dig down and try to figure out why did he think it was meaningless? Yeah. Wow. The first thing, as anybody would notice, was that he was going after all of this for himself. Mm. In verse 10, he says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Mm -hmm. That was his first issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was going after all of these accomplishments and all of this effort for himself. Mm -hmm. Is the reason it pained him so much mm -hmm. that he had to hand it over to somebody else. Mm -hmm. That he had no control after he was gone for what people are going to do when he had accomplished. Because he didn't do it for anybody else but himself. The warning that we find, number one, is that we are living our lives for ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we are working hard and putting all our efforts, be it into a relationship, be it into a, joy, a job or an accomplishment, it's all going to come out. Mm -hmm. It's incredible that he says that he hated his life because of the work mm. that's done under the sun. It resonates because most people that have jobs, not every single one, most people that have jobs, you know how they feel about their jobs? Mm. We all hate those jobs. <laughs> it's not funny, it's something that we all, like all people, all cultures all over the world, that's one thing we all have in common. It doesn't matter how much, in a sense, salary we get, whatever like the little perks and the benefits of the job is, we all hate our jobs. Yeah. We all hate the fact that I have to wake up early. 
and go to an office or go to a place and just work and just work. And it feels like every day there's more work to be done and the work never ends. It's like the example of the guy who works at the post office. And it's like every day I wake up early and I go to the post office and every day there's letters. It's like, why don't people just stop? <laughs> Like, every day I go in, and there's a stack. Everybody hates their jobs. But in a sense, jobs and work is one of the number one things that's similar for all cultures all over the world. Mm -hmm. That we all got to work to eat. Yeah. So then why do we hate our work so much? Mm -hmm. Somebody be like, well, because we're just a bunch of lazy people. That's what bosses want to say to us. Yeah. But we know from reading Solomon that no, not every single person is given to laziness. Mm. That some people actually enjoy the effort they're putting in there because they feel like I'm getting somewhere, I'm accomplishing something, but I still hate it. Mm. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. In Genesis chapter 2, I think we find a little bit the reason why we all hate work. Mm. It says in chapter 2 of Genesis, <coughs> excuse me. We'll pick it up in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from every, any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. We find out basically from Genesis chapter 2 that when God created man, he puts him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it. So from day one, from the very beginning of our existence as human beings, God put us here to work it. Mm. But then, obviously, he gives him the command not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which you know he and his wife end up doing. And so then what was the result? They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So here in chapter 3, we find out the punishment. It says in chapter 3, verse 17, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Mm -hmm. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will. Mm. Doesn't that sound a little bit like what Solomon was describing? That's it, bro. That's it right here. That's it. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, they basically go from living in the paradise of God, the Garden of Eden, where yes, they are working it, but they're working for God. Mm -hmm. And so they get to be in the presence of God. They get to enjoy their relationship with God. To being kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Mm. Being kicked out of the presence of God because sin separates man from God. Yep. Now they're separate from God and now they get to work for themselves. For themselves. Mm. And the difference between working for God in the paradise of God in the Garden of Eden to working for themselves is that the ground is cursed. Now. Mm. And so now all work is going to be what? Painful toil. Wow. And that's why Solomon says to us, I hated my life. And all the work and the labor and the toil I have to put in there. He says, they're going to put their efforts into the ground, but it's going to produce thorns and thistles for you, and you eat the plants of the field. That the more effort they're putting into the ground, it's not going to produce, in a sense, the fruits, trees, the crops that they wanted. That will come, yes, but it comes with thorns and thistles. Anybody who's had a garden or basically take care of a lawn or a farm before knows something. That you work hard to plant whatever crop you want, be it beans or wheat or whatever. But the thing that you're not putting effort into but keeps coming up is the thorns, the thistles, the weeds. Do you know anybody who's ever planted weeds before? No. Do you know anybody who has tended to weeds before? No. Do you know anybody who has taken care of weeds before? No. But they're always weeds. No one is taking care of them. But they won't go anywhere. But then the beans, the crops, the wheat that you're putting the effort into, they don't always work out. It says, by the sweat of your brow, 
you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from which you're taken. Mm -hmm. And that's what Solomon was saying. That I'm working so hard and it's so tough. And you know, when it's all said and done, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to leave it to somebody else who's going to come and they might actually be a fool. <laughs> and they're going to destroy everything I've been working for. Wow. And Solomon did not know it. But he was living out what God has said would happen. Mm -hmm. When a man is separated from God mm -hmm. and is trying to work for himself. Wow. But there's a difference. We can actually turn the tables. Go to John chapter 4. Come on, John 3. In John chapter 4, Jesus is speaking to his disciples as they are, in a sense, by the well in Sychar. And the disciples say to him, verse 31, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. <laughs> then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now the harvest the crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. That's the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of your labor. Mm. The disciples were trying to encourage Jesus to eat. Mm. He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing. About. Yeah. And obviously the disciples are a little bit confused. They're like, wait, we went out to go buy him food. So did somebody like sneaking food to him while we're trying to buy him food? It's like, no, 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 no. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Whereas the disciples obviously were fighting for food to eat to sustain their physical body. Jesus is like, the thing that satisfies me, the thing that fulfills me, the food that I desire is to do the will of God. That's how we turn the tables. When we go from men and women who are toiling every single day for the food that we eat, and we become men and women who, just like Jesus, desire the food of fulfilling the will of the God who put us here. Mm. That's when the tables are turned. Come on, God, great. That, in a sense, we begin to find out was what was missing in Solomon's life. Mm. With all his wisdom, what was missing was he was working for himself. Yeah. He was trying to find meaning in his existence, in his life, outside of God. Yeah. And he came to the realization that it was all meaningless. Mm -hmm. When we work for the Lord with all our might, just like Jesus was doing, we're going to find out what true meaning actually is. Mm -hmm. Our life will be full of meaning. Our life will be full of fulfillment because we'll be living out the God-ordained will for which he put us here on this planet. Right. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. Chapter 5. In verse 1, he says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they are doing wrong. Mm. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty with your, in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. And so let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not to fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore stand in awe of God's. Our second point, worship the Lord with reverence and awe. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Here in Exodus 5, Solomon is changing course here a little bit. Because, yes, in our first point, we're trying to find out that the only way that I can actually find fulfillment in my life is I make a decision to work for the Lord. That if I prioritize 
fulfilling the will of God in my life. Just like Jesus says in John chapter 4, they're going after harvesting souls for him. But in here he says, guard your steps mm. when you go to the house of God. Mm. When you go before God, he says, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Mm. What's the sacrifice of fools? He's like, it is the person who is quick with their mouth, who is hasty in their hearts, whose words are many. Why? Because they make a vow to God and they are not fulfilling it. Mm. Mm. Says so when you make a vow to God, one, don't delay in fulfilling it mm. because God has no pleasure in fools. And also, it is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. We live this way because, like he says, we need to worship the Lord with reverence and with awe. Mm -hmm. We actually have to have an understanding of how awesome God is, the creator of the universe. So we stand in awe and we revere him. Mm -hmm. When he says we make a vow before God, obviously our first understanding is like, oh yeah, if I make a decision that I'm going to give my contribution and stuff like that, whatever I vow says don't delay fulfilling and give it. And that's true. But when we also make a decision to become a disciple, yeah. we're making a vow to God. Wow. It's supposed to be an irrevocable vow that I'm going to live for God for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Not just in good times. Yeah. I'm vowing my life to God. Because like we understand, when I make a decision to become a disciple and to live for God, it's a contract that I'm signing between me and God. Mm -hmm. A contract that is signed in the blood of Jesus. And blood, as we all know, yes, is supposed to symbolize life and death. Because when there's blood, it usually communicates that the thing is alive. And also when there's blood, it also communicates that the thing is dead. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Like if you walked into a place, don't picture this, very bad. <laughs> and you saw a lot of blood on it, it's like, oh yeah, something has died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's like for the first thought. So the presence of blood kind of makes it, ooh, something is dead. But when you go to the hospital and they try to figure out, are you healthy, are you strong? They check your blood pressure. And so blood is life and death in it. And so what's amazing is that the contract that we have with God is signed in the blood of Jesus because it took the death of Jesus mm -hmm. to give us life eternal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That Jesus was willing to die, shed his blood, so you and I could live for God eternally. Mm -hmm. Life and death. Yep. Right. And so he says, when you make a vow, don't delay in fulfilling it. God has no pleasure in fools. Mm. It's better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Mm. It's the reason why Jesus says, obviously in Luke 14, count the cost. Yeah. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Before you make a decision, I'm going to live with God. God's my one priority. I'm going to love God more than anybody else. <laughs> and Jesus is like, let me help you here. First, wipe away your tears. Dry your tears. And then think about what you're vowing here. Because I have no time for the tears of food. Please, it's, it's right, it's right here. I'm not. Praise, praise, bro. Praise. I read it's it. in the Bible, bro. It's in the Bible. He says, he, says, he, says, he has no pleasure in fools. It's, it's not me. It's right here. Praise, bro. <laughs> so don't stone me. I'm just reading the Bible. Since when we stone people in church for reading the Bible? Like, since today, I'm just coming. What Jesus is expecting us to do is to make a vow and to keep it. Yeah. Even if it hurts. Yeah. But then what if I find myself, just like he's saying here, that I've already made the vow. Mm -hmm. He says, well, then don't let your mouth lead you to sin, and do not protest the temple messenger, my vow is a mistake. Mm -hmm. Don't turn around and like, hey, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I was rash. Like, you know, when you're offering the salvation thing, it sounded so good, I wanted a part of it, so I jumped at it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it. It's like, we don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. We'll find ourselves having made a vow that is time to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to be men and women who worship God with reverence and awe. Mm -hmm. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Come on, Come on, right. Right. Oh, Come on bro. Don't worry, we're not going to read the one you think I'm going to read. Oh. <laughs> In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll pick it up here in verse 14. 
It says, Hebrews 12, Make every effort <coughs> to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his, inherit his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. We'll pause there for a second. He says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The word holy actually means set apart. So he says, as a disciple, as a Christian, we're supposed to live a life where we are set apart. We're separated from the world, from everything else around us. Because it works in the opposite direction to sin. Sin separates us from God. Holiness separates us from the world so we can be with God. Does that make sense? So he says, make it your efforts to live at peace with all men and to be holy, because without holiness, no one will see God. So then see to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble to our many, and that nobody is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessings with tears. Mm. Esau was guilty, just like Solomon was talking about, of making a foolish vow. Mm. He was hungry. Mm. And so he comes in, and yes, his brother Jacob tricks him. It's like, yeah, you're hungry, you're starving, so why don't you just sign over your inheritance rights as the oldest son to me? I'll give you a bowl of soup, you eat it, and you're not dying. Mm. Yes, he was hungry. Yes, he was farmish. But he was not going to drop dead. Yeah. He was hasty. Yeah. He made a foolish vow. Oh. And it says, afterwards, he sought the blessing with tears. But he was rejected. Yeah. And that's exactly what Solomon also tells us. God will have no time for the tears. Yeah. Why is, in a sense, Esau brought up here? Why is what Esau did such a big issue? Because what it says here, see to that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance to rest him. Why is he godless for that rash vow that he made? Because in the Old Testament, the oldest son, yes, inherited the inheritance that the father was going to give, but it also inherited the relationship that the father had with God as the spiritual leader of the family. Wow. So in a sense, in those days, the spiritual leader was essentially like the prophet, was like the mouthpiece. Esau was supposed to inherit that. Not just the property, but he was supposed to take his stand as the man of God for his family Amen. until the death of his father. But it shows you how Rashi was. He didn't even care about that. He sold that right for a bowl of soup. You and I as disciples gets the same rights that Esau rashly threw away. We get to be God's representatives on this earth. We get to be ambassadors of Christ. We get to be men and women that have the spirit of God dwelling in us. And so he says, make sure that you're not godless like Esau. That you don't throw away that blessing. You don't throw away that inheritance as quickly as Esau did. Live in reverence and in awe that as a disciple, as we rescued from the darkness, we're supposed to live in reverence and awe that God would love us so much that he'd rescue us. Mm. If we live in reverence and awe, understanding that, wow, that God himself desires to dwell in me, mm. that I too can be the light of the world. Mm. Let's pick it up in chapter 12, verse 18. Mm. He says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, yeah. and that's burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, you've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. 
You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirit of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Mm. Verse 28. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Worship the Lord with reverence and awe. In the second part of chapter 12, here in verse 18 through 20, as we read, he gives us the illustration of when Moses and the Israelites came through the Red Sea and arrived at the base of Mount Sinai. And obviously, if you study it out in the Old Testament Exodus, it says that the presence of God descended upon the top of that mountain. That there was darkness, there was gloom, there was storm, there was a trumpet blast, there was lightning, there was fire upon the mountain. So much that it says, even Moses himself, the man of God, is like, I am trembling with fear because the God of the universe, the creator of life as we know it, has descended. It says they were so scared, even of God's command, that even if an animal touches the mountain, it should be destroyed. Mm. Because God's presence upon that mountain had made it holy, so it was supposed to be set apart. Mm. So nobody could go near it. And as we know from the story, the people were so afraid when God began to speak to them through the storm, that they begged that Moses, rather, go up the mountain, go hear the words of God, and come back and speak to him. That is the pattern of the prophet or the messenger of God. That God desired to speak in the hearing of all his people. But the people were trembling with fear. They were so scared. They were like, please, don't let God speak to us. He's too holy. We will die. Let one man, one representative go up. Hear the words of God and speak to us. That's what we get to be as disciples. We get to be the men and women who have the Spirit of God in us, who have the Word of God in front of us, who then are tasked, just like Moses, of communicating God's Word wow. to a lost and dying world. Mm -hmm. That's why we worship God with reverence and awe. He goes further. It says, even though that sight was tremendous and terrifying, that's not what you've come to as a Christian. That when we gather together as a people of God, yes, there's not a mountain that's on fire like Moses and the Israelites saw. It says there's something even more wonderful. It says you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spiritual righteous man made perfect. When we got together as church, yes, you look around and like, yeah, it's a hotel room. It's like, no, 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 no. You've come to Mount Zion. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. And like, yeah, but I don't see them. That's the point. He's calling us to see through the eyes of faith. Mm -hmm. He's calling us to worship God with reverence and awe. Mm -hmm. That yes, I may not physically see it, but spiritually that's what's going on around us. That we're surrounded with thousands upon thousands of angels who are joyfully assembled before God. And if you read the picture in, in Revelation, it says they are bowing down before God. They're casting down their crowns and they're worshiping God. And they are saying, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you must imagine that they're looking at us and wondering, do we have the same level of reverence and awe that they have? Because they are in the same place that we are. Come on, brother, please. It says, you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. To the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Mm. That's what we talked about. That we have come here because of the blood of Jesus. Mm. Jesus, who chose to mediate between us and God, even though we don't deserve it, even though we're not good enough, we're not holy enough to come before God, Jesus is willing to spill his blood to open the door so that you and I can come before God. But he says that the sprinkled blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And I don't know about you, but I've always wondered about that phrase. It's like, what does that mean? Like the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Well, think about it. 
Abel was murdered by his brother. Yeah. And so his blood was crying out for justice and revenge for the king. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was also murdered by his brothers and sisters, everybody sitting right here. Yeah. But the blood of Jesus that was spilt doesn't cry out for justice and revenge. It cries out salvation yeah. for you and I who murdered him. Wow. That's why the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Mm. Abel spilled blood called for revenge mm. upon Cain. Mm. Jesus' blood when you and I spilt calls for salvation, yeah. calls for mercy, calls for grace for those of us who are guilty of murdering him. Mm. It is why we worship the Lord in reverence mm. and in awe. The scriptures teach us in John 4 that God is seeking true worshipers, men and women who worship him in spirit and in truth. It's men and women who understand what God has done for us by being willing to draw us to himself, that we will dedicate our lives to worship him with reverence and with awe. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, Solomon writes, we'll pick it up here in chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 15. It says, In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these things a righteous man perishing in his righteousness, and a wicked man living long in his wickedness. Do not be over righteous, neither be over wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over wicked. And do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Mm -hmm. Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in the city. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Skip on down with me to verse 29. This only have I found. God made mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. <laughs> Solomon, in trying to encourage us to worship God and reverence it in awe, says, I've realized something, even in this meaningless life of mine. A righteous, per a righteous person perishing in their righteousness, and a wicked person living long in their wickedness. That blows our minds sometimes when we have a simplistic understanding of what right and wrong is supposed to be. Mm. Because deep down, we're like, if I've made a decision to worship God and to be with God and to be a good person, then all the wicked people amongst me should drop dead. <laughs> or at least bad things should happen to them. Yeah. And so that what breaks our minds and our hearts is just like what he says, when a righteous person perishes. And when we see a wicked person living long and prospering in their wickedness, Right. It hurts our hearts. Right. How do I know? Is the, this is the reason why we've come up with the saying or the question. The number one question people have for not wanting to have faith in God. You know that question? Yes. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's right. And when we ask that question and we believe that question and it's basically deep in our hearts, it's because we've missed what Solomon is saying here. Mm -hmm. He says, don't be over righteous, neither be over wise, don't destroy yourself. Mm. Because in a sense, we live in a world of extremism. Mm. It's like, I'm choosing to be extremely good <laughs> because the people that are bad, bad things should happen to them. Mm. And that might make sense. Good things should happen to good people, bad things should happen to bad people. That's why when I wear shoes, I put on black one on the left and another black one on the right. They match. Right? Amen. Amen. Well, we're, we're expected to match, right? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> like, am I the only one who thinks like the shoes and match? <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. We think that it's utterly unfair for a wicked person to have good things. Right. Mm. And he's like, don't be over wicked, do not be a fool, why die before your time? What is he calling us to do? He's saying, 
Remember, verse 20, there's not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Mm -hmm. Nobody's perfect. And so it is good, verse 18, to grasp the one and not, not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. He's calling us to avoid all extremes. Mm -hmm. But don't be over-righteous. Don't be over-wise. And don't be a fool. When he says it's good to grasp the one and the other, in a sense, if I'm trying to grasp something on this side and on that side, where am I? I'm balanced. Mm -hmm. I'm in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's what he's calling us to do. To live a life where we stand in reverence and awe of God, understanding that we're not even good enough to behold God, but God makes a way for us to go there. So don't be over-righteous. And don't be over-wise. Because it will only destroy you. How do I know? Because people's faith gets destroyed when they see wicked people prospering. Mm -hmm. People have stopped having faith in God because they've seen unfairness and cruelty in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, verse 15, in this meaningless life of mine, we've basically lost sight of God. Mm -hmm. Go to Matthew real quick. Right. In Matthew, Jesus, in a sense, tries to get us to understand these concepts. <clears throat> we need this good. Come on. And in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Do not judge, or you'll be judged. Verse 1. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged, and with the measure you use, will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of salt that's in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time it's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the person who can clearly see that his brother or sister is in sin. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the brother or sister who can clearly see that the brother and sister have messed up, mm -hmm. that they're wicked. Mm -hmm. And in their good heart, they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, bro, there's a, there's a speck of sword dust in your eye. Let me take it out. And Jesus is like, the whole time you've forgotten that there's a plank in your own eye. Mm -hmm. You too have sinned. Mm -hmm. In a sense, when we are in sin, but are trying to help others in sin, as if we don't have sin, we're trying to be over-righteous. So it's not self-righteousness. Right. It's got nothing to do with God. Mm -hmm. Some people read this and they're like, you know what, okay, hands off. Each man for himself, <laughs> God for us all. You <laughs> live your life, I live my life, and on judgment day, maybe I see you, maybe I don't. Oh my gosh. But we miss the heart of God. Yeah. He says, verse 5, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Mm -hmm. We miss the command in the heart of God. What's the command in the heart of God? The command of Jesus is to help our brother, but to put ourselves in the best position to help them. Mm -hmm. And the best position I can be to help my brother is by taking the plank out of my eye so I can see clearly enough to be able to help him. Not just so I can take the plank out of my eye so I can be better than him, mm. so he should accept my help. Wow. I'm taking the plank out of my eye so I can see clearly enough to be able to help. Yeah. That's what he's calling us to do. Look here in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on, Kweku. It says in verse 43, You have heard that I was said, Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward would you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Mm. He says that in chapter 7 is because in chapter 5, he'd already told us the heart of God. Yeah. He says the heart of God is that he makes it rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Yeah. In a sense, if it was up to you and I, what we would do is that if there's a farm of a righteous person next to the farm of a wicked person, it would only rain here. Yeah. Yeah. So that the farm of the wicked person would basically just dry out and then you would lose everything. 
it was up to us. We would be the one sitting next to our classmate who's cheating, and we choose not to cheat. And we're just waiting for lightning bolts. It's like just kill him where he is. Because he's wicked. And it's like, that's not God's heart. And he lets it rain on both the righteous and on the unrighteous. He treats us the same, basically. Why? Because it says, if you love those who love you, what reward would you get? Wow. Because God loves his enemies. God loves even those who do not love him. Amen. Now, that would make us feel two things. We're like, so then they're wicked people. It's like, it's like, they're never going to get punished. Yeah. Because you and I fail to see the plank in our own eye. Yes. Yes. Fail to see that you and I were enemies of God. Yes, exactly. The only reason we're here and we get to be saved is because God loves his enemies. Because yeah. if not, would have been destroyed. Yeah. So God is doing for others, same as he's done for us. So then why do we have a problem for it? <laughs> because we didn't get his heart. Yeah. Look at verse 20 of chapter 5. Jesus says, For I tell you, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. It says if your righteousness does not surpass that of the Pharisees, because what did the Pharisees do? They did all these things that we're talking about. They did an eye for an eye. They were the ones who, even though they were steeped in sin and their hearts were far from God, they saw themselves as the teachers of the law, the ones who were trying to lead others to salvation. He says, no, you actually have to have the heart of God. Mm -hmm. If not, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. It says, we are to worship the Lord with reverence and awe. It is us understanding the incredibly loving heart of God that makes us stand in reverence and in awe. Wow. That God would have enough love, not just to love those who love him. Because if he did, all of us would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That's what makes us stand in reverence and all. That's why we avoid all extremes and we're not legalistic yeah. because we're like, by that, none of us would be spared. Yeah. We would all be destroyed. Yeah. And it's like, that's the vow he's calling you and I to. Mm -hmm. The vow to be his ambassadors, mm -hmm. to be the ones that have the spirit of God living in us, the ones that desire to have the heart of God, those that are seeking God in spirit and in truth. To worship God in reverence and in awe. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes. Wow. Yeah. Chapter 9. That's great. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We'll begin to end. It says in verse 11 I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Mm. Nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the leonard, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them all. Our third and last point, watch for the Lord with eager expectation. So I was like, you know what, something I've seen in life, the race is not to the swift. That always makes me laugh because it's the, the old time story of the tortoise and the hare. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, if you've seen it on the cartoon and stuff like the tortoise and the hare, they're about to race. Everyone's like, this is dumb. Like, why are they be racing? Why are they be competing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, the hare is going to run circles around him. But we know what happens. The hare gets complacent. So the tortoise wins. And he says, the race is not to the swift. Mm. The fastest person doesn't always win. Mm. The battle's not too strong. The strongest person doesn't always win the fight. Mm. He says, you know, another sad thing, food does not always come to the wise mm. and wealth to the brilliant. He's essentially saying, these are things that I have seen that in my opinion makes life meaningless. We read this and we relate to it and we're like, yeah, that's why life is unfair. Mm. But the thing 
that puts it all into perspective is what? No man, verse 12, knows when his hour will come. Watch for the Lord with eager expectation. Death comes to us all. And in light of death, it basically, like it says, death is a great equalizer. It puts everything into perspective. It's been always said that no matter what a man or a woman has toiled their whole lives to accomplish, when they're lying upon their deathbed and they know that their life is ebbing away, they don't call out for the things that they've accomplished. That when a person lies upon their deathbed, they don't call, hey, I'm dying. Could somebody bring me all the degrees I've accumulated one last time so that I can behold them? Wow. Nobody says, that Mercedes Benz that I fought my whole life to get, could you guys bring it so I can drive it one last time? <laughs> it's like that company or that building or that hotel, whatever, bring it one more time so I can enjoy it. No, because in that hour, it's just like a fish that's being caught in a net or a bird that's being caught in a snare. Mm. For all men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Mm. He's beginning to help you and I understand that irrespective of what our perspective on life is, whether we think it's fair or unfair, if we think we're toiling for nothing or not, and we feel like our lives are meaningless, our expectation of the end brings it into sharp focus. Mm. Because it is our expectation of the end and our knowledge that the end is coming that actually will give value to the things we've been chasing our lives. Mm. That's when we know what true value is. Look at chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes, verse 9. He says here, Be happy, young man, while you're young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart or whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. For youth and vigor are meaningless. Remember your creator, chapter 12, verse 1. In the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Mm -hmm. He says, yes, death is a great equalizer. But it doesn't just end there. There's also judgment before God. Yes. So he says, yes, be happy in your life. And you can't be like, wait, 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 Paul Solomon, you just started your book by telling us that life is meaningless. <laughs> then how can you then bro follow me and be like, be happy, enjoy your life. Let your heart bring you joy all the days of your youth. Because Solomon begins to understand mm. that there's a judge waiting at the door. Mm. So that in a sense, if this existence is all that you are going to have, then you better enjoy it. If this life is all you are going to experience, then you better enjoy it. And now we begin to understand why you thought it was all meaningless. Because if this life is all that we're having, then yes, it's a toilsome burden of meaningless proportions. This is all we're going to have. Because he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because the days of trouble will approach. And the years will come when you say, I find no pleasure in them. Mm -hmm. It's time to actually have godly perspective. Knowing that the true God, the judge of all mankind, is standing at the door and he's watching what you and I have done with our lives. Mm -hmm. And now, when you think of it in that way, life begins to actually have a lot of meaning, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Go to Mark chapter 13. Oh, okay. In Mark 13, Jesus, speaking to his disciples and trying to give them perspective about the end, says in verse 32, Mark 13, verse 32, says, no one knows about that day or the hour. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, 
whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn, if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. He says, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the sun. Only God knows. He says, be on your guard. Be alert. What does he mean? Watch for the Lord with eager expectation. Mm -hmm. Be on your guard. Because any moment now, God could come back. Mm -hmm. Be on your guard. Be alert. Because any moment now might actually just be your last. He says, it will be like a man going away who leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with the assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. He says, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. And therein lies the rub. Because, yes, we might not feel like Solomon, that life is unfair and it's meaningless, but you know something? Your life is not your own. Mm -hmm. He says, the owner of the house is coming back. Mm -hmm. The perspective he was trying to give them is like, it's going to be like the owner of a house going away, leaving his house to his servants. All that we are and all that we have actually belongs to God. Mm -hmm. It's the reason why he can stand in judgment of us. And so if that's the perspective we're supposed to have, then life actually has a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. Because it's the owner's house that we're supposed to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. We've been entrusted with life. We are stewards of the life that God has given us. So yes, it's only meaningless and tiresome and a burden if we're trying to do it for ourselves. But then it has a lot of value and a lot of meaning if I'm doing it for the owner. That's why we're to watch with eager expectation. Jesus, in a very incredible way, says here, If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. It's cool how he says, don't let him come and find you sleeping. One of the hallmarks of people that are depressed and have given up on life is what? Sleeping. It's like, I, I just don't want to deal with it right now. I just can't. So we sleep. And what's incredibly, incredibly sad is that when the sleep does not do it for them, you know what they do? Suicide. It's the forever sleep, isn't it? And that happens just like we're seeing right here when a person has lost sight of the fact that we're a steward who has been entrusted with life. That's the only reason why, just like the illustration Jesus says up here, the servants will fall asleep. If they've lost sight of the fact that at any moment now the owner is going to come, he's going to stand in judgment. But if I know, just like he says here, that the owner is going to come at an hour that we're not aware, and I take heed to the warning that Jesus gives of watching, then I stay alert. Mm -hmm. I stay awake. I don't let it sleep to my eyes. Mm -hmm. Because life is truly valuable. Mm -hmm. And so, so meaningful. And as a disciple, it's not just my life that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. The lives of all those that I could impact mm -hmm. has to be so much more meaning. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 20. Come on, please. Come on, bro. Bro. Solomon closes out Ecclesiastes in this fashion, chapter 12. Let's go quickly. Says in verse 9 Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goats. They are collected saints like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been done. Maybe it's not friend of mine. All the students are like, much study wears the body. Like, yeah. <laughs> so he knows what I'm feeling. Yeah. Verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. 
For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Mm -hmm. It says, the teacher, obviously Solomon, was wise, and he imparted knowledge. He pondered and he searched so that he could set up as many problems and say just the right words. And it says, the words of the wise are like goads, they are like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. It's all from God. He's the one shepherd. And he says, of making many books, there is no end. Is it not our experience that every year there's a new book? Yes. It's a new concept, yes. it's a new philosophy, it's a new way of looking at it, it's a new self-help section in every library and every bookstore. And I'm not saying any of that is bad. Someone said, this is what will happen. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if I can leave you with one thing, here's the conclusion I came up with mm. in this meaningless life that I experienced. <laughs> Fear God. Yeah. Yeah. Keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. That is the whole duty of mankind. Wow. That is why God put us on this planet. And he says, and just in case you don't feel it that way, be warned, verse 14. God will bring every deed into judgment. Every hidden thing, whether it is good or it is evil. And when we think about it all, we have that one thing to say. Solomon was credited with supernatural wisdom. He researched more than you and I could ever research. He knew more and experienced more than you and I could ever experience. Mm. And he leaves us with one thing, fear God. Mm. Wow. And there's nothing else we can add to it. Mm. Fear God. Mm -hmm. Even in the midst of meaninglessness, in the midst of toil and pain, he has but one thing to say, fear God. Mm -hmm. And that's the word to the wise, and to God be the glory. Come on, come on.